70, time for an age-friendly health and social care system. I want to launch the report that's been written about this event and go through the recommendations contained within it. And I want to talk finally about how we can take some of these recommendations forward in the coming year. So as most of you know, last year's May event was about health and social care. At that event, we heard from experts who talked about age-friendly initiatives across Greater Manchester. These experts included Warren Heppelet, um, Executive Lead for the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership, and we're lucky enough to have Warren returning to join our panel later this afternoon. But most importantly, we heard from you, our network members. We asked you to discuss three questions in our workshop. So firstly, we wanted to hear about how you maintained your health and well-being and what support organisations, systems and communities provide that supported you to do this. Then we wanted to hear how the system's not age-friendly and what needs to change. And finally, we wanted to hear about your priorities for an age-friendly health and social care system. So following the event, Amanda Priest, a consultant, and myself wrote up the findings from the workshop into a report. We're launching our report today and the full version is available on the MAP website and there are copies in the marketplace room next door if you want to have a look over lunchtime. We've tweeted about the report this morning and it would be great if people could retweet to help spread the word. And that's hashtag GMOPN Health. I wanted to share with you some of the findings that reflect the broad range of discussion that we had on the day. So before I talk about the findings directly, I just want to draw your attention to this quotation from the World Health Organization because it really reflects the findings of our report. So it states, health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. One of the most important features reflected in the findings was that the network members considered it fundamental that health was thought about both holistically and positively in terms of the broad range of things that make up an individual's state of well-being. So the infographic displays that the influences on health and by extension social care are wide ranging including individual and environmental factors. Those environmental factors include housing, social facilities and transport. Importantly, it also displays how every older person is different in terms of their level of health and functioning. So that difference in variety was very much echoed in the range of discussion about how people maintain their well-being. There was a strong emphasis on healthy eating and exercise, but also an appreciation of the social aspects of maintaining well-being. People talked about socialising with friends and family, or being involved in local groups and activities. People also emphasised that taking part in new things and continuing to learn was a key part of maintaining well-being. Intergenerational activity was also a strong aspect for many participants. Another important feature of the discussion was an understanding that social infrastructure was fundamental to keeping well and active. The activities that older people took part in were varied, including gardening, walking, swimming and arts and crafts. However, there was also a recognition that not everyone has the confidence to seek out and engage with these activities and groups on their own. People noted that social prescribing and signposting could be effective, but required that the infrastructure was there. We hear a lot of talk at the moment about social prescribing, and it actually forms part of one of our recommendations 
but its success can only be achieved in areas where groups and activities are available um, to signpost people to and to recommend. This highlights the importance of the voluntary and community sectors and the need to support and invest in this in order to maintain that fundamental social infrastructure. So, when participants spoke about how the system was not age-friendly and what needed to change, there were some consistent themes that emerged. People felt the system doesn't factor in that older people often need more consideration around time, access, support, advice and prevention. Participants emphasised that the health system was often not flexible and features such as the difficulty of getting GP appointments and 10 minute consultations could be particularly challenging for older people. People also emphasised that hospital letters were often difficult to understand. These are all difficulties that are not peculiar to older people and it's an area where improvements and greater flexibility would make things better for everyone. Transport was again a, th a strong theme, with people emphasising how important this was in order to access health appointments. The importance of appointments time to coincide with restrictions on travel passes was again mentioned as fundamental. The final point that I want to make in relation to how the system is not age friendly is that people were very aware of the lack of positive portrayals of older people in the media. <coughs> this was considered important both as a means of maintaining self esteem for older people and to protect against ageism and stereotyping amongst the general population. One participant remarked, stop telling me I'm old and tell me about the positive, about how to live well. <clears throat> so the final question asked of the participants was what should be the priorities for an age-friendly health and social care system? The network felt that one of our priorities should be to promote positive images and language in the media to challenge the way older people are viewed in society. They also expressed that advice on healthy living was paramount. Older people needed education on how to stay healthy and avoid isolation. They also needed better access to information about healthy living and support and services that could support them. The discussion on the need for social infrastructure brought out that statutory health and social care services need to be better integrated with the voluntary and community sectors. One priority was seeing voluntary services as partners. There was also a great deal of discussion about care at home. People felt that better planning was needed. For hospital discharge to ensure that proper care was put in place as needed, and also, in broader terms, they felt that a priority should be celebrating care staff and improving the credibility of this as a career choice. So, from the discussions that we held on the day, we developed recommendations. So the first of these was to focus on the good. Good news and positive stories about older people need to be shared with media outlets to increase positive language and promote a view of older people as valued members of society, encouraging a focus on health and well-being rather than illness. Some of you may have heard about the No More Wrinkly Hands campaign. Um, which has been trying to change perceptions of how older people are viewed. It challenges the media to stop using photographs of dismembered body parts and close-ups of wrinkles with stories on ageing issues and later life. Instead, it asks for images of older people just being themselves. 
Supporting campaigns like this is one way that the Older People's Network can push this recommendation forward. As some of you know, we worked with the Health and Social Care Partnership to help their develop, sorry, to help develop their framework on resilience and independent living. Partly due to this um, feedback from the network about positive language, it was decided that this strategy document should avoid calling itself the frailty charter and instead frame itself in these more positive terms. So, the next recommendation is to encourage intergenerational activities. Intergenerational activity should be encouraged to promote better communities and support, such as older people volunteering in schools and school children volunteering in the community or care homes. Victoria spoke earlier about how the Older People's Network were involved in the Lords Committee on Intergenerational Fairness and Provision. We saw the um, little video of, of Jan um, talking about her experience there. We'd like to continue to focus on intergenerational activity in the coming year and may look to work with the Youth Combined Authority to hold a joint event at some stage. So our next recommendation is to develop services to meet older people's needs. This would mean taking services to older people where needed, rather than them travelling to services, and better appointment times for older people. From our transport report, it was clear that older people still struggle to get to some appointments because of restrictions on their travel passes. A change to the way appointments are allocated is an important area where we should look to make changes. This links to the next recommendation, which is about ease of access to GPs. Local clinical commissioning groups need to engage in discussions around ensuring ease of access to GPs to older people. This would limit the possibility of individuals falling through the gaps in services. People recognise that GPs are under increasing pressure, but some older people are amongst the most vulnerable members of our communities, and we need to make sure that GPs are accessible to everyone. Further to this, the network recommends that GPs encourage healthy lifestyles to combat isolation, poor diet, and lack of exercise. Strategies should focus on social prescribing and signposting to local services or groups via GPs or GP navigators, with particular emphasis on social activities, exercise, learning and involving volunteers to support people to engage. However, as I alluded to previously, not all areas are well served in terms of their social infrastructure and um, social prescribing can only work in conjunction with a voluntary and community sector that's sufficiently resourced to support this. The next recommendation relates to consideration around key infrastructure. Work with local councils and key organisations such as Transport for Greater Manchester needs to be undertaken to encourage consideration around key infrastructure such as timings on pedestrian crossings, public transport access and more um, and better seating in public places. Health can't be maintained without consideration of this key infrastructure which allows people to access health services. And further to this, an age-friendly environment is fundamental to support older people to remain active for longer. The network further recommends that healthcare workers should be available to help older people understand medical letters, appointments and medication. This could be a support network led by their local GP, surgery or pharmacist. Good pharmacists should always ask whether people need any support with understanding how to take their medication. Perhaps we could suggest that pharmacies also pilot schemes to support people with reading medical letters if they find them hard to understand. 
As with many of our recommendations, this would benefit the whole community, not just older people. The network also recommends that strategy and policy should encourage learning from best practice in other areas to ensure that Greater Manchester keeps up with the best examples in the country and internationally. I referred earlier to the Greater Manchester Framework for Resilience and Independent Living, which the Older People's Network was involved in last year. This work was very much informed by these principles and it's important that any new strategy and policy is open and outward looking to ensure that Greater Manchester has the best health and social care services that it can. So our final recommendation may perhaps be the hardest to achieve. Strategies need to ensure that home care is valued as a career both financially and through other types of rewards and recognition in order to improve care for older people at home. Being able to age well at home is one of the biggest priorities for many older people and many of them will need to receive care. However, caring is not currently highly valued as a career. The Older People's Network would like to work to change this and we've considered that we could perhaps do this by supporting recognition of carers through the Great British Care Awards or the Greater Manchester Health and Care Champions. So, I've already talked about how we might take forward some of these recommendations individually, but I just want to finish by talking about how we're going to try to push these recommendations forward as a whole. So firstly, next month we will be holding the first of our focus groups on health. We'll be inviting all members of the network to come along to this with the aim of retaining a strong group that will help ensure our recommendations stay on the agenda for the network and for Greater Manchester. The workshop that we're holding this afternoon will give some of you the opportunity to discuss the recommendations and provide some guidance for this group about how we could most realistically and usefully campaign and take them forward. Those that don't discuss the health report will be looking at our other network reports on transport and housing. Finally, we need to make sure that we continue to be involved in consultation on health and social care issues. Some members of our network attended a Care at Home event in December and we need to make sure that we continue to be involved in as many opportunities to get our views across as possible. So thank you very much everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to supporting the network to take these recommendations forward in the coming year and making sure that the voices of older people continue to be heard. So thanks very much. <laughs>